Hey there folks and welcome back. Up to now we've been studying the basics of double integrals. We can evaluate double integrals of reasonably nice functions over reasonably nice regions of type 1 or type 2, but it turns out there are lots of nasty integrals out there that we still can't evaluate very easily. Take for example something like this. The double integral over this region d of this gross function, e to the root x squared plus y squared divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared. Oh, this function looks horrible, and the region isn't much better. You can see that this region d is bounded between two circular arcs, one of radius 1 and one of radius 2. The arc of radius 1 can be described in Cartesian coordinates using the equation y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. And the outer arc, the arc of radius 2, can be described by the equation y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. Working with functions like this can sometimes be pretty tricky. If I saw these as upper and lower bounds of my integral, I'd probably start sweating. In fact, setting up the integral isn't an easy task either. After all, this region D is not a region of type 1, because over here, my lower bound is given by the circular arc, but over here, my lower bound is given by the x-axis. Likewise, this isn't a region of type 2. Over here, the circular arc is our leftmost curve, but over here, it's the y-axis. So we're being asked to integrate a gross function over a gross region. What do we do? Well, if you think about it, this region is gross in Cartesian coordinates, but in polar coordinates, it's actually not so bad. You can see that our region consists of all points where phi, the angle our points make with the positive x-axis, is between 0 and pi over 2. 0 is less than or equal to phi, is less than or equal to pi over 2. What about our radius rho? Well, rho extends all the way out from this circle of radius 1 to this circle of radius 2. So rho is between 1 and 2. And that's it, folks. Our region has a very simple description in terms of polar coordinates. Our variables are actually bounded between constants. When we were working in Cartesian coordinates and our variables were bounded between constants, we said that we were integrating over a rectangle. Well, now we're integrating over what we might call a polar rectangle. In fact, it's not just our region that cleans up when we switch to rows and phi's. Our function is going to simplify dramatically. Remember, in polar coordinates, x squared plus y squared is really the same as rho squared. So our function is simply e to the rho over rho. So why don't we go ahead and try expressing this entire integral with respect to rows and phi's. We can first integrate with respect to phi from 0 to pi over 2. Then we can integrate with respect to rho from 1 to 2, and our function becomes e to the rho over rho. Of course, we still have this dA term at the end. Wow, this really goes to show that by changing coordinate systems, by changing perspectives, we can turn an integral of a really nasty function, or an integral over a really gross domain, into something much friendlier. The last major question we have to address here is what happens to this dA term when we switch from x's and y's to rows and phi's? Well, remember, the main idea behind the double integral is that we're adding up a whole bunch of tiny little volumes. In Cartesian coordinates, we're adding up volumes of rectangular boxes, and the volume of a box is given by the box's height, which is the value of the function, times the area of the base. The area of the base, dA, is a really tiny change in area, and in Cartesian coordinates, it can be computed as a tiny change in x times a tiny change in y. Delta A is delta x delta y. That's why you see dy dx or dx dy written at the end of an integral in Cartesian coordinates. But now we're not dealing with x and y. When we convert to polar coordinates, we're going to be dividing up our region a little bit differently. We make tiny changes to our angle phi and tiny changes to our radius rho. That's going to divide up our region in this way. As you can see, our boxes are no longer rectangular. The base is a bit curved, right? So the area of the base isn't simply delta x delta y or delta rho delta phi. It's going to be a slightly more complicated expression. We need to figure out what that expression is in terms of rho and phi in order to finish this conversion. Okay, here's our picture once again. In the xy plane, we've made tiny, tiny changes to our radius rho, 
and tiny, tiny changes to our angle phi. This breaks up our domain of integration into a bunch of little curved rectangles, which we refer to as polar rectangles. You can see that rho is bounded between two constants and phi is bounded between two constants. We need to determine the area of one of these polar rectangles, which we'll refer to as delta A. Now notice that our delta A term is going to depend on how far our polar rectangle is from the origin. If we're talking about a rectangle that's close to the origin, we expect its area to be quite small. But as we move farther away, it looks like the areas are getting bigger. So this delta A term, which I've blown up for you over here, should depend on the radius rho. Let's suppose that we're measuring delta A at a distance of rho units from the origin. So this length here is rho. This extra little bit here is our tiny change in radius, delta rho. And this tiny angle here is our tiny change in angle, delta phi. Okay, we need a game plan for computing delta A. Ah, well, notice that delta A is really the area of this big wedge minus the area of this small wedge. And both of these areas represent a portion of the area of a circle. Let's start by looking at the area of the big wedge. This represents a portion of the area of a circle whose radius is rho plus delta rho. So the total area would be pi times the radius squared. That's pi times rho plus delta rho squared. But of course, we're not going the full two pi radians around. We're only going delta phi radians around. So we have to multiply our total by delta phi over two pi. We can do something similar with the area of the small wedge. This represents a portion of the area of a circle whose radius is rho. So the area would be pi times rho squared, but again we have to multiply by delta phi over 2 pi. The difference in these areas represents our change in area delta A. Okay, now this looks a little complicated, but you can see it's already starting to clean up. We can throw out our pi terms, and in the hope of simplifying this thing, I'm going to expand this bracketed term. I get rho squared plus 2 rho delta rho plus delta rho squared all times delta phi minus rho squared delta phi all divided by 2. Ah, I see even more simplification. We have a rho squared delta phi and a rho squared delta phi. These terms kill each other, and we're simply left with 2 rho delta rho plus delta rho squared all times delta phi divided by 2. Now remember, delta rho and delta phi are supposed to represent really small changes to our radius and angle respectively. So if delta rho is small, delta rho squared is ridiculously small. It's so small that it doesn't make any appreciable difference to the calculation of our area, delta A. So essentially, we can just ignore it. This term is approximately zero. We're simply left with rho, delta rho, delta phi. Now, as these terms approach zero, our change in area, delta A, is going to approach the infinitesimally small area, dA, which is rho, d rho, d phi. And there you go, folks. This is how we write our area factor dA when converting to polar coordinates. Just as we expected, it depends on rho. The farther our rectangle is from the origin, the larger this expression will be. Let's see how we can use this on the next slide to finish our integral conversion. Okay, putting it all together. Suppose that you're trying to compute the double integral of a function f throughout some region r and either the function or the region can be described most conveniently in terms of polar coordinates. For example, maybe you're integrating over a region whose boundaries are arcs of a circle, sort of like what we saw on the first slide. That's an awesome time to use polar coordinates. More generally though, it could be the case that the boundaries of your region depend nicely on the angle phi made with the positive x-axis. In this case, we can convert our integral to polar coordinates as follows. We start by integrating with respect to our independent variable phi. In this picture, it looks like phi goes from phi 1 to phi 2. Next, we integrate with respect to rho, reading from the innermost curve to the outermost curve. So here, rho is going to go from rho 1 of phi to rho 2 of phi. Of course, we have to convert our function. So we'll replace x with rho cos phi 
and we'll replace y with rho sine phi. Finally, we have to convert our area factor, dA. Well, as we saw in the last slide, dA becomes rho d rho d phi. And there you go, folks, a handy little formula for converting Cartesian integrals into polar integrals. Now, whatever you do here, don't forget this extra rho term. It's so easily forgotten, but if you leave it out, it's going to lead you to the wrong answer. We'll end this video with one last look at that nasty double integral from the first slide. We had mostly converted this gross integral into polar coordinates with phi ranging between 0 and pi over 2, rho ranging from 1 to 2, and our function becoming e to the rho over rho. We're just missing our area element. So what do we do? Well, we're going to multiply by rho d rho d phi. Ah, and you can see that it's going to simplify even more. These two rows kill each other, and we're left with a very friendly double integral in the end. Go ahead, try to evaluate it. It becomes very straightforward. You should get a final answer of e squared minus e times pi over 2.